Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, so we're going to pick up. Uh, we kind of finished up with Ephesians last week, so uh, in your notes, so if you have the you notes, know, so I gave you I gave you the notes last week, but I also had the the People's Bible from from Ephesians. Right? Uh, and I know that caused a little confusion when we were reading and going back and forth last last week, so. Um, so we're going to be using this, uh, these notes uh, this morning. We finished up with page five last time, um, and I guess finally, any any final questions on on Ephesians? I guess before, uh, so what we'll do is we'll get started with prayer, and then uh, we'll see if there's any final comments or questions on Ephesians, and then we're going to move into uh, Romans and hopefully First uh, uh, Thessalonians, or I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians again um, th this morning. Okay, so let's begin today with prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for gathering us together again around your word today. We ask that you would uh, open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our hearts as we study your word together. Uh, help us to uh, glean that truth from your words, uh, reminding us of the comfort that you always seek to give uh, in showering your grace upon us. Uh, bless us as we study today and fill us with that comfort and peace that only you can give. We ask it in Jesus' name. All right, um, and then again, um, so page five, any final questions from page five yet? All right, let's move on then to page six, um, and we're going to start with uh, another section of, of God's Word that uh, just provides us with, with just so much comfort and to, to understand that that really is God's purpose in in uh, uh, giving us these, these words. So uh, just a little context again going into, because uh, these are the last words of Romans chapter 8. So <clears throat> in order to understand the last words of Romans chapter 8, we need to look at the beginning of, of chapter 8. And at the beginning of chapter 8, there's actually the word therefore. Uh, and I've mentioned that to you in, in Bible study before. Uh, so what's the key every time you see the word therefore? Stop and see what it's there for. All right? Because when God uses the word therefore, he's connecting it to other words. 
Um, so chapter 8 begins with the words, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, well, what's that therefore coming from? Chapter 7 is that, is that struggle that the Christian has. Uh, and Paul is writing as a Christian uh, and talking about his current and daily struggle with, with sin. Um, and please understand that that is the context. It's, it's important to understand that we as Christians are in a daily battle with temptation and sin. Um, and I've described it this way. I think we, we talked about it um, on Thursday night in our Bible Basics classes as well. Um, none of us as Christians wakes up in the morning and says, I'd really like to cause a lot of destruction today. I'd like to be mean to my spouse. Um, I want to hurt my children. Uh, I want to make them cry. I, I want to, uh, you know, I want to, you know, make everybody mad at work. I really want to just leave a trail of destruction today. We don't wake up like that. Uh, but there's many a day when we finish the day, and that's exactly what's happening, right? So how do, does that happen? Well, that happens because we have this sinful nature, right? And we want to do good, but evil is right there with us. And since evil is right there with us, what we do is not the good we want to do. The evil we don't want to do, and this is, this is really key to how God says it here, and remember, Paul is uh, the Holy Spirit is using Paul's personal experience in his life. He says, the evil I do not want to do, this is what I keep on doing. He understands that, that that's not the real, the real Paul. Right? It's sin living in him, but he can't escape that. As long as we are living and breathing in this sinful world, we are going to have this sinful nature that struggles with doing the right thing. All right, uh, we are page six in the in the notes, right? So uh, not the not the people's Bible stuff that I gave you last week, but uh, on in this this lesson, okay? So page six, uh, uh, and so he goes on and says, "This is what I keep on doing," and. You can, you can just hear the frustration building in his voice as he uh, keeps looking at his life. He looks at his thoughts. The beginning of chapter 7, he says, uh, I never would have known what coveting was if the law had not said do not covet. And when I realized what coveting is, sin sprang to life and I died. Right? Because my sinful nature fools me into thinking, as long as I don't deliberately hurt somebody and say things that or do things that are going to hurt them, I'm not sinning. Right? So I can, I can keep the, the fifth commandment to not murder. As long as I don't physically hurt somebody or kill somebody, I'm keeping that commandment. And then the Lord says, do not covet. And I look at what the Bible says about coveting, and it, it gets <coughs> into my thought process. And God says, I condemn you for your thinking about being mad at people. Even if you never say or do anything against them, that still condemns you as a murderer. Okay, I guess I commit murder every day then. There's no hope. Uh, well, I, I, I try, to, try to listen to the authorities. I may not always have the best attitude towards those authorities, but I, 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 I obey them. God says, well, what's your attitude toward them? If your attitude is a, is a poor attitude towards any authority, and you just do it because you're supposed to and your heart isn't in it, you're breaking that commandment. And I say, oh, no. Right? You see why he says, sin sprang to life and I died? Right? Uh, because now it gets into this, this aspect of, and I've, I've said it before, and I think it bears saying again here too, anytime we are not perfect, we are sinning. I'm going to let that sink in for a couple seconds. Every time we are not perfect, we are sinning. Do you understand why at the end of the chapter then of Romans 7, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? Okay? But there is an answer to that question, right? The answer is, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ. 
Jesus rescues me from that. And he's the only one who can rescue that, rescue me from that. I can't rescue me from that. I can't try to just not sin. I can try, but I'm going to fail, right? And I'm going to end up at the same place that, that Paul does in Romans 7 when he says, what a wretched man I am. What I'm trying to do that's good, I don't do. The bad stuff I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. The only way out of that frustration is Jesus. Which is why then the therefore comes at the beginning of chapter 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of that frustration that he had in chapter 7, it disappears in Jesus. Okay? And I'm gonna, I, I want to let that sink in for a couple seconds too. Right? All the frustration that we have with trying to do what's right and keeping doing what's wrong, that all is eliminated in Jesus. He paid for that guilt. And then God reminds us that the Holy Spirit testifies that we are God's children because of Jesus. And if we're children, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Right? This, this term of endearment. Right? This isn't... This isn't only God who is standing on his throne and waiting to judge us for all the bad things that we've done. This is God's love for us, our Heavenly Father, who is also Jesus' Father. And now because of what Jesus has done, we're adopted into God's family through baptism. God counts us as his children. God acknowledges us as his children. If we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God. We're co-heirs with Christ. Okay? He builds on that relationship of what Jesus has done. Still acknowledging, right, we're still sinful, still acknowledging that we're going to, because we're heirs with Christ, we're going to share in his suffering, but we're also going to share in his glory. And then uh, right after he finishes that section, he begins this, this final section um, in verse 18 of chapter 8. And he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Uh, we need to keep that in mind. Right? That is so important to keep in mind. What we go through in this world, he's not saying it's not bad. He's not saying, oh, don't just brush that off. It's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. But the glory in heaven is a bigger deal. In fact, so much of a bigger deal that it's not even worth comparing with the awful stuff that we might face here in this world. And then God tells us why it is that we can look forward to that and why it's not worth comparing. Because we have a Savior who's accomplished all of this. And, and that gets us then into these, these words, uh, even through the groaning and, and everything. Uh, but we have, we have uh, you know, our... Our Savior who intercedes for us, we even uh, hear in the verses right before this, the Holy Spirit also uh, intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He knows exactly what we need. And, and uh, the triune God is, is working that out to give us exactly what we need when we don't know what we ought to pray for. Right? And that, I believe, is, is, happens in two different situations. Sometimes we understand, right, in a situation, say, I, I, I just don't know. I'm not sure what to even pray for because of this situation. I don't know what the right, right way out is. And so, God, I just turn it over to you. Sometimes we don't know what we ought to pray for. Sometimes we think we know what we want to pray for, but we really don't. Right? In both cases, the Spirit intercedes for us and, and takes care of it uh, so that uh, now we get to, to verse uh, verse 28. Um, and let's zigzag through. Uh, David, would you start us uh, off? Uh, David Bray. Uh, and we've got two Daves in here. Uh, so if you want to start with verse 28 and then 29, and we'll just zigzag all the way through. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among men, brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall
shall we say in response to what Jesus said? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who, <coughs> excuse me, he who, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution <coughs> or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for you, your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For we are convinced that he who first loved us, who the angels in heaven, who who has spoken of the future, that he is trusted, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, these last two verses are uh, was actually my confirmation verse. Uh, so these are these verses are very near and dear to me. I go back to them all the time. Uh, but how how would you define election in light of these verses? What what key things does God tell us about our election? Okay, he, right, and there's a there's a uh, what's what's described um, at the at right under uh, right after question three, right? There's a, a golden chain that is that is found in these in these verses, um, and <coughs> all these things are connected in in this whole picture of God's God's election, God choosing us. Um, Margaret, God knew us. Um, with an undeserved love from before time, just in eternity. And what is the result of that? And, and uh, I, I sign every. I don't know if you, if you, if you notice this. I sign every email with this. If I check, uh, sometimes I put verses at the end of emails. Do you read down that far? <laughs> check it out this week. Verses 31 and 32 really are the key to understanding what this election in from eternity means. It means God is for us. All right. Let's let's dissect that. What what does it mean that God is for us? It's out, first of all, Phil, Phil makes a really important point. First of all, this is outside of us. This has nothing to do with me. God is for me. God, right, if you are, if you say, I am for this person, right, you are making a choice to back this person, right? It means God is on our side. So, since God is for us, what does he say? Who can be against us? What's the answer to that question? No. Nothing and no one, which is what he really finishes with in verses 38 and 39. Right? This is all kind of one, one big section here where, where the Lord is, is reminding us. Right? So, so we know that in all things, God is, is working for the good. Right? And, and if you think of the word good... We use it in two different ways, don't we? What's the normal way you think of using the word good? Not bad. Not bad, right? Or, so, not bad. I like this, right? Oh, that's a good restaurant. You should try this out. Oh, this is a really good recipe, right? I really like this. That's not what God's saying here. 
Right? Uh, the Greek actually is two different words for, for good, and that's not the word that he uses here. How else do we use the word good? No good. What? No good. Well, I but it no good in what sense? It's bad for you. It's it's no good for you. No. Not really. No. Okay. It's when when you're growing up and mom knows that you don't like Brussels sprouts, but she puts them on your plate anyway. And she says, eat this, it's good for you, which means, right, this is beneficial, right? And how often does the word beneficial include the other way that good is used? Rarely, right? Um, and I, I, I used this, this quote from a, a, a movie the other, the other night in, in one, I can't remember if it was Wednesday or Thursday night Bible study. Uh, but right, we know, right, from God's word, we know what the truth is. We know the path that God wants us to take, and we know it's a beneficial path. But why do we so often not choose it? All right. I, I either don't like it or it's too hard to do it. Right? Did you have you, you ever have you can your think of your, of your children if if they are toddlers or or back when they were toddlers? And I've heard kids say this before when when mom is mom and dad are, are trying to get them to do what's right. It's just too hard to be good. <laughs> Right? Your kids ever say that? It's just too hard to be good. And it doesn't change when we're adults, does it? It doesn't change. But God says, this is beneficial. And he says, all things are beneficial for those who are in Christ Jesus. All things are beneficial for those who are in Christ Jesus. And why are all things beneficial for those who are in Christ Jesus? And this is going to help us to understand um, the theme of the service today, too, when God is, is redefining, right, definitions uncovered. God is going to uncover his definitions, which are exactly the opposite of what the world says. Dave. God used them for our benefit and many for us. He takes the bad things and uses them for his glory and for our personal benefit. Right. And I may not always see that, right? In fact, many times I don't see it. Not right now. I God doesn't even promise that I'm going to see that benefit this side of heaven while I'm still alive here. There are things that are happened that have happened in my personal life that I still scratch my head and say, I don't get it, God. I really don't see how this is beneficial. This was bad, and, and all I can see is bad from this. But you say this, so I have, I'm going to trust you on that. Uh, and and you know, if you don't let me see it this side of heaven, I'm still going to trust you on it. And when I get to heaven, these eyes are are going to are going to see everything perfectly. The other aspect that God tells us is that no matter we we cannot determine whether something is good based on how it looks to our eyes. Because these eyes deceive us. And think of how many things that you thought were good end up ended up biting you. Right? I really thought this was good. And it comes back to bite you in the butt. And then think of how many times that you've had really challenging times and difficulties. And you wanted it just to go away. And then all of a sudden you see the Lord opening up some incredible blessings as a result of that bad thing. It's a perfect example of, of uh, our second lesson today. We're actually uh, going to be studying the first lesson from Jeremiah chapter 17. Uh, but in the second lesson today is Paul's thorn in the flesh in, from 2 Corinthians 12. Right? He says, there's, there's this thorn in the flesh that I have. It torments me. 
I even went to the Lord in prayer, and three times I asked the Lord to take it away from me. And it's God's answer? You know the words. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then he goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And then he finishes that section with, with those words that just don't make any sense at all unless they are said and heard through the eyes of faith. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What does he mean by saying, when I am weak, then I am strong? What does he mean by that? When I really realize that I, I am weak and I, I am in this situation, I have nowhere to turn but, but to the Lord. And that's when God shows his strength. His strength is always there. His strength is actually getting me through the good times, but I don't always realize that as much. Right? It's very easy to get into, uh, into coast, coasting mode. Right? When, when things are going well and, and you know, I'm working hard at things and they're successful and, and my, my sinful brain starts to, starts to reprogram my mind and think, I'm doing a good job here. Right? Things are really going well. Um, I've got everything under control. Uh, I'm using all these, all these uh, abilities that I have and, and it's successful. And, and, I, and, and it's very easy for me to simply push God out of the equation. Or at the very, at the very least... Right? push him in behind me and say, thanks God for supporting me. Uh, you know, I'll, I, I'm going to continue, continue doing this, but you know, thank you for supporting me in this. Uh, that still isn't really giving God the glory for, for that, right? the glory that God deserves. Uh, God is the one doing it. I'm along for the ride. Um, this goes back to our uh, Bible basics lesson from, from Thursday nights on, on works. Uh, if you think of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are God's workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Right? You look at, at, a, at a piece of, of, of art, uh, you know, on, either on your wall or in a museum, you're not honoring the piece of art, are you? You're honoring the artist who, who painted that, or the sculptor who sculpted it, or, or whatever. Uh, and God says that he is the artist. He is, is the sculptor. We're the works of art, right? Beautiful, and, you know, and gifted, all these things. Uh, but the honor doesn't go to the, to, the, to the work of art. The honor goes to the one who, who created that work of art. And it's a, that's a, just such a, a beautiful way of, of seeing that. Um, so what does God do? God allows us to have these times in our lives when we struggle. And as we struggle, we see God's love and power and grace and care, all these things just... Uh, just I, I truly believe that's why oftentimes people have... Uh, you know, really horrific times before they close their eyes in death. Right? Illnesses that, that, that may take away some of their abilities and, and you know, their health, health declines and all these things. Right? Uh, God is reminding me when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Right? Um, it's not, my, it's not my, uh, my diet and my exercise and, and you know, my, my, you know, uh, all my abilities and, you know, trying to, trying to live this, this life that's just going to conquer... God reminds me, right, so that, that his love and his grace and his mercy can shine on me. Uh, because, again, what's the number one thing that God wants for us more than anything else? To be with him. He wants us to be with him in heaven. And that's more important than a good job and a, a, a comfortable lifestyle and a, a, a government that allows us to live in, in peace and, and with all the blessings and benefits that we want uh, God says that is all way down on his list of priorities. He wants us in heaven with him. And, and that's always number one with God. And so all these other things that fall into place uh, in, our, in our lives, things that we just assume maybe not have, say, well, God, I can do without this. Um, God says, mm, no, this is, this is good for you. 
right? This is your Brussels sprouts on the plate. Now, I love Brussels sprouts, so that's not a good, that's not a good, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> hey, all right, so, number two then, in what ways is the truth of God's election used to comfort the readers of these verses? John. He helps us get through bad times. He gives us hope. All right, how? You're, you're exactly right. How does that happen? This goes back to what Philip said at the beginning of, of, of study today. Every, everything that happens to get me through a difficult time in my life happens outside of myself. Right? It's not what I do right, to pull me up by my bootstraps. Or you know, think of all the phrases that, that people use. You just got to snap out of it. You, you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You've got to just... Grit it out and you know and get and get through it. There's a, a commercial on TV right now uh, that I think helps to, to understand that. It's it's someone with clinical depression, right? And and I, I and they're they're talking about their medication and, and they're talking about all the things that people have said to help them through their 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 their, their depression. Uh, and it's it's these words like well just you just gotta gotta you know grit through it you gotta just have a more positive outlook and you you gotta you gotta you know do all of these things and if you if if you have clinical depression or if if you've ever talked to anybody that has that what are they what are they gonna say to those those kinds of that that advice that good advice that you're giving to them to to just kind of get out of this you gotta you gotta just Work harder at, at having a brighter outlook on life. And you roll your eyes and say, ah, "It's not within us; it's outside of us." Okay, um, and 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 please understand, being clinically having clinical depression is different than being depressed. <clears throat> hey, please, do you, everybody understand that, <laughs> right? All right, having clinical depression is different than being depressed. There are events and circumstances in my life that cause me to, to get into a funk, to be depressed. Clinical depression is an actual brain disease, right? Where it they may have everything going for them and they're still depressed, okay? It is, it, it is uh, and the studies have, have, you know, this is a real, this is a real disease and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, mental health disease is such a, a difficult part of, of the medical profession because if, if I have a broken arm, my, my arm is in a sling, right? And you can see, or if I, if I, have, uh, if I have pneumonia, right? I can't breathe and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm on oxygen and all these things, you can see that. But someone who has any kind of a, a mental health disease may physically look perfectly fine. They may even be able to put on a mask and function in day-to-day -day life. Uh, but they're sick. And, uh, but, and, and so, uh, but the, the same thing holds true in our lives as we try to get ourselves out of, out of things that take, take place. Right? So, so being depressed can often, can, what can help being depressed is the circumstances changing, right? For someone with clinical depression, the circumstances changing doesn't, doesn't solve it. It doesn't solve it. Um, and, uh, but in our, in our lives as believers, we have to understand that the things that take place in our lives and the way that those things get solved are outside of ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean I just sit back and say, okay, God, you, you get me out of this. Okay? Um, God, in his chain here, right, he's connecting all the dots, and we're going to see that in our, our, um, uh, in our worship this morning as well. Uh, when when uh, Jeremiah uses words that are, are almost 
uh, parallel with Psalm 1. Uh, if you think of, uh, right, the Right? Blessed is the, is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on it he meditates. Right? And he says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water. Right? Now, Jeremiah is going to take that and, and through the Holy Spirit take it one step further. Right? So um, he talks about a, a tree that's out in the desert that's struggling. But he says this tree that's planted, and literally what he says, it's, it's transplanted, right? So what does God do? God takes us from the desert wasteland of, of what we have by nature, which has no ability to do anything. And God transplants us by the rivers and streams of his, of his words and promises. And so that tree, he says, the tree doesn't worry even during a time of drought. Its leaves are always green, and it never fails to bear fruit. Why? Because it has a continual source of, of nourishment. God does this for us. God does this outside of us, but God uses means to accomplish it in our lives. And as God uses those means, that's why, that's why we're doing what we're doing this morning. That's why from here we're gonna we're gonna go into God's sanctuary and we're gonna worship and we're gonna we're gonna dig into God's word together some more, um, and through word and and prayer and and song, God is going to going to fill our hearts with with the nourishment that we need. And then as you go home, right, you're gonna stay in God's word this this week, right? And Lord willing, you're gonna be you're gonna be in your in your scriptures on a daily basis. You're gonna be. Uh, Gathering around God's word with your families, right? You're gonna you're gonna be growing in God's word on a regular basis, so that when those droughts come, right, those leaves stay green, uh, and that really is key, right? God God does it all, but God works through through means, right? So, what part does Paul say that believers play in their salvation? No part, right? All of these verbs are passive verbs. All right, now again, here's a little grammar lesson, right? What's the difference between an active verb and a passive verb? Active is something you do. Active is something I do. Done to you, for and you. passive is something that is done for me or to me. Exactly, exactly, right? Uh, and so... So we have God uh, taking, taking care of this, right? It's all God doing, doing the work. Uh, and that, that is true even as right, we are in God's word, as we are, are, are studying, right? So uh, look, at, look at the way he, he says, right? Those he justified, he also called, or uh, let's see. He predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. Right? So, uh, and God did not spare his own son. Right? So who's going to bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? God says he's chosen us. Who can bring any charge? Nobody. And this really helps us to understand how the devil works. Um, he, is, he is the devil. right? He's a liar and the father of lies. But the Bible also describes him as Satan. Right? The accuser. And what does Satan do? He tries to bring charges against us, doesn't he? He's, he's a master at temptation. Because first of all, he lays that temptation out before us and makes it seem like the absolute best thing to do. Did God really say you're not supposed to eat from every tree in the garden? God knows that when you eat of it, you'll, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. Right? And so he looks at the fruit, sees that it's pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom, she takes it and she eats it. And once the devil tempts you to do something, what does Satan do with what you've done? At least he does it to me. I don't know, maybe he doesn't do it to you. All right, so, so what, what's the next step after getting you to sin? You really messed up. You're a believer and you did that? How can you call yourself a believer and do what you did? You 
you even think God could love you after this? Has it ever happened to anybody? It happens to me. How could God love you after what you've done? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Nobody. Not even the devil himself can do that. Uh, Luther has, has a lot of writing about that. He, he was tormented by this for much of his life. And, and the reality is that the devil's right. right. When he calls me a sinner, he is right. When he calls me a wretched person, he is correct. Say, yes, you are correct, but I have Jesus. And Jesus has paid for this. Jesus has redeemed me. Jesus has removed my guilt. I'm God's beloved, redeemed child. And you can't accuse me of anything because Jesus took the guilt for me. That's how, that's how we, we escape these, these times that the devil and, and Satan tries to, tries to accuse us and, and tries to get us to wallow in that, in that guilt and, and grief over, over our sin. Right? Now, don't get me wrong, right? Guilt is a beneficial thing. Right? We need to remain attuned to what God says and how we, how we fail in that. But hanging on to guilt, that's an unnecessary torment that we put ourselves through. <clears throat> All right, so that, that chain that God... God puts in uh, during this, this time, right? So the, the chain that's, that's found, in, and he says, right, so from eternity, right, God knew, right, so, uh, right, so he, uh, those God foreknew, he also predestined, right? So this goes back to eternity again, right? God's word is clear on that. He knows, he predestines, and then, what does God do? He calls. He justifies. And he glorifies. And that goes into eternity, right? So we have eternity on both sides, don't we? We have from eternity, this is God's love for us. God knew. God chose. And then, right? God calls, justifies, glorifies and takes us into eternity. All right, so this is an eternal act of love on God's part. All by his grace, and all working through means, as we saw last time, right, in Ephesians, that this happens in Christ, in him, right? Uh, and remember, we, we looked at that and, and, and underlined how many times that, that, uh, that shows up in those verses, and how important that is, that what God says he does for us, he does it, as Philip said, right, outside of ourselves, but it all happens in Christ. And which is the way he began the, the chapter, right? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and once again, that, that term, in Christ Jesus, and I don't know if an illustration, because my... I flunked art class, so this this is not going to be. All right, so out here we have the world, outside of the circle, right? The world, sin, all the things that, that happen. In Christ means that we are inside, inside this sphere, inside. Uh, inside this, this sphere or this, this bubble. Um, and uh, if you remember years and years and years ago, there was um, a, a boy that, that made, he made the news, he had a, a, an autoimmune disease that made him susceptible to pretty much everything, right? And so how did they protect him? Had a big bubble around yeah, he was called the bubble boy, remember? Um, and um, I think Seinfeld even did a, did a if, you're, if you're a Seinfeld fan, there was, a, there was an episode on that too. But, um, but, but, when was that boy safe? When he, was in the bubble. when he was in the bubble. What would happen if he goes outside the bubble? He gets sick and dies. Right? God says there's no condemnation 
in Christ Jesus, right? So by God's grace, we are in the bubble with Jesus. Which means there's no condemnation. Sin is forgiven. Guilt is removed. Blessings are there because it's our relationship with Jesus that makes us blessed, not how good or how bad things are going in my life. We are in Christ Jesus. And that is that gift of faith that God, God says, I'm putting, I'm putting this bubble of protection around you. You are in Christ. And that's, that's why he says, right, at the, at the end of that section, right, so who shall, who shall separate us, uh, right? Uh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, right? And as he's listing all of those things, And I guess as I read through that list, trouble, hardship, I can, I can relate to. Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, those aren't, you know, I've lived a very blessed life. Right? I, I don't have a lot of, a lot of that. Um, but the people first reading this, right, they're going to they're gonna relate to that. Um, the, the, the believers from of old, right, Old Testament times, right, they, they have that as well, right? And, and so, uh, so the, the Lord does, does give us that, uh, that quotation from, Psalm, from the Psalms, right? For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Jesus is going to refer to that uh, when, when he describes, um, you know, the words sound very much like the Sermon on the Mount, but this is the Sermon on the Plain that Jesus is going to give, give to us today from, from Luke. Uh, very similar content, uh, similar audiences, uh, but he says, blessed are you when, blessed are those who hunger, right? Blessed are, are those who, who are poor. Blessed are those who are, are persecuted, right? Uh, and remember that as they treated you this way, that's the way they treated the prophets of old. And he says, whoa. Woe to those who are well fed. Woe to those who are rich. Uh, well, woe, to, uh, woe, to the, woe to you who are, are spoken well of, because that's the way they talk about the false prophets. Okay? Um, and, and again, what's Jesus doing? He's taking these definitions and he's flipping them upside down. He's turning them on their head. Um, and, and Jesus, Jesus uh, helps us to understand that this, this, is, this is life as a believer. We are blessed because we are in Christ. We are in that circle. We are in that bubble. So that the circumstances, no matter how good they are or how, how awful they, they may seem, whether, whether those, those awful times are coming um, as a result of illness or, or maybe some, something that happens outside of us that, that the people are inflicting upon us, um, that, that doesn't determine my, my blessing or, or being cursed. Right? Uh, and and we have to, uh, there's, a, there's a struggle even as believers to get beyond that. Because when, when good things are happening, I feel blessed by God. When bad things are happening, I feel like I'm being cursed. And God says neither one are true. I'm blessed because I'm in Christ. The circumstances don't determine how blessed or cursed I am. I'm in Christ. And so he says, he's transplanted us by those streams of water. Um, and still, so stay close to those, those things that, that God, God gives us. And that really helps us then to determine uh, how, in, in what am I trusted? Right? Uh, you can, it's, it's kind of a litmus test. And it's, a, it's kind of a scary one. Uh, but I'm going to talk about it in the sermon again too, right? What's the, what's the litmus test to see whether I'm, I'm putting my trust in Christ? Well, when things start to fall apart in my life, how do I respond? Do I fall apart with the things? Um, do I worry and fret and stay up all night? Um, if, if I do, then I was trusting in the wrong thing, right? And I go to the cross of Jesus and I say, Lord, forgive me. 
uh, because I was trusting in the wrong thing, and, and you helped me to, to see that I was trusting in the wrong thing. Uh, and so uh, we, we, we seek to, to stay close to Jesus so that, that when those times come, uh, right, the, uh, so if I've, if, I've, uh, if I've learned some car maintenance and how to, how to change a tire and all those things, uh, when I get a flat tire on the road, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to upset me, but it's not going to freak me out. Right? Because I've learned how to change a tire, and I can get out and I can change the tire. If, I've, if, I've, if I don't even know where the spare tire is, and I get a flat, now, now, right? um, now I'm worried. What do I, what do, I do? You know? what? And, and the same, same thing is, is, is true in our lives. Right? If, if, we're, if we're in God's word and we're, we're continuing to grow in, in God's word, we're, we're surrounding God's promises where he, he tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, he reminds us that, that his words and promises are what strengthen us during, during that time. Then, as Isaiah 43 tells us, right, when you walk through the fire, right, when you pass through the, through the waters, um, I love that passage because uh, the Lord is speaking to his people who are about to go into Babylonian captivity. Uh, but again, God's choice of words there. He doesn't say, if this happens to you. He says, when. Right? Uh, they will not overwhelm you because I'm your God. When these things happen, it's, it's not going to overwhelm you. It's not going to take you away. Because I'm your God. I've chosen you. Right? I've, I've, you've been mine for forever. And, and that's what he tells us at the end of the, end of the chapter is, as well. Right? Uh, and right? I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, present or the future any powers, height, depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when you look at that list that he, that he mentions there, right, and, and what does he say before that, right? In all these things we are more than conquerors. Uh, literally what he says, we are super conquerors. We have already won the victory. Why can, why can God say here that we are more than conquerors? Through him who loved us. Through him who loved us. Again, Bill, I'll ask you to repeat what you said at the beginning. <laughs> right? Outside, outside. It's outside of us. Right? We are more than conquerors through something that's outside of us. Right? I have not fought through this and won the victory because I have such a strong faith. God has gotten me through this by giving me trust in him. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved us. Uh, God says the same thing, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 15 at the end of the resurrection chapter. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Remember how that goes on, right? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus won the victory, right? He won the power over death, right? He broke the sting of death by rising from the dead, and death has now lost its sting. But he gives us the victory. And then don't forget the end of that chapter. He says, therefore, ah, right? Stop and see what it's there for, right? He says, therefore, let nothing move you. <clears throat> Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Right? Jesus has won the victory. He gives us the victory. So nothing we do in service to our victorious Savior, sharing in that victory, is ever a waste of time or energy. John. Interestingly, this all ties in to the Great Commission that Jesus gave us to baptize in the name of God, the Son, the Holy Ghost, so that all people around the world may enjoy living in Christ. Mm -hmm. 
forget the end of the, don't forget how Jesus continues in the Great Commission, right? He says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to, to obey or observe, right? To, to treasure everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, right? So baptize, teach everything. Right? So that people treasure what God says. Right? Please, and, and, and uh, we've only got a couple minutes, so I can't, can't go into uh, a lot of detail. But we've studied that word obey before. Right? When he says, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Uh, Jesus is simply saying, teach them everything so that they, they know what God expects of them. That's not what Jesus is saying there. Uh, he's saying, teach them to, to uh, tereo is, the, is the, the Greek verb there. And we get the English word treasure from that. Um, and, and if you just substitute the word treasure for obey them, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to treasure everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Right? Um, and by the way, that's one of the reasons why we have the exhortation in our baptism service. I actually had a, uh, uh, a baptism uh, yesterday. And uh, a little uh, Clara Calhoun became a child of God yesterday. yesterday. Uh, is, and uh, and as, as we finish the baptism, right, then comes the exhortation. right? Because Jesus commands not only that we baptize, but also that we teach them to treasure everything he's commanded, right? And so along with, with the command to baptize is the command to grow in God's word. And that's, that's true both for a little baby who's baptized, right? For that training that continues after, um, as well as for someone who's older who hasn't been baptized, that we train them, baptize them, and then continue to train them, right? So the teaching is always involved along with, along with the, the baptism. Uh, which is the powerful word of God in action, and then we continue to use that powerful word um, in in taking taking what God has created and and continuing to uh, to use the means that God God used to create that faith, which is the same mean, means He's going to use to strengthen and keep that person in their faith. All right, questions on that? Comments? Uh, Again, a, a treasure section of, of scripture. Um, in fact, um, people who are going through challenging times, uh, I, I actually advise them, uh, go back and just read Romans chapter 8 every day while you're going through this. Read it every day uh, because it's going to help you to, to see who you are in Jesus. It's going to help you to see how, how these, these difficult times are, 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 how God is using those. And that, that you know, getting through this, this difficult time is outside of yourself. Uh, this is God working in you. But please don't neglect the means that he uses to get you through this. Right? Um, and, you know, God, um, God has designed our relationship with him to not be a 911 call. Oh, this is emergency, God. I need you now. Um, it's that it's that regular time in in God's word, not not only for emergencies, right? In case of in, you know you don't keep your your Bible in the wall with you know in case of in case of emergency, break the glass and read your scriptures, right? Um, that that's not what God has designed His word to be. All right, let's close in today with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you that. Uh, your grace and your mercy continue to be showered upon us. Uh, Lord, help us to remember as we go through each day of our lives, whether that day is, is, uh, has good circumstances or difficult circumstances, to remember that uh, because of what Jesus has done, we are in Christ. And being in Christ, there is no condemnation. That means that nothing can separate us from your love that you have for us in your Son, Guide us and fill us with that comfort that we may continue to cling to your words and promises every day as we grow together in your words and promises. Uh, help us, Lord, also to reflect that in our lives that others, too, may know that comfort that you intend for them. We ask it all in Jesus' name.
Thank you. 